I sing constantly at home to my cat, mostly songs about him. This is Champagne is also a band podcast. One songwriter, one song. I'm Sven, your host for a journey into the music of Champaign-Urbana. Recorded in the Blue Box studio with a songwriter from the Champaign-Urbana music scene, past or present. Champagne is also a band podcast is proud to be a part of the Champagne Showers podcast network. Welcome to Champagne is also a band podcast. Today I have Briar Schlenker, aka Monstrosity Complex, and you may know Briar from such musical groups as Improvisers Exchange Ensemble, the New Music Mosaic, the Goodwin Avenue Trio, and they also have played with Zoe from episode 16 with Zoe X. Breyer. And in the song that we're going to be listening to today, the Briar Schlenker Trio. Briar, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Today we're going to be listening to Electrophorus. So without further ado, let's listen to the song.
welcome back. Prior, one of my first and favorite questions to always ask is what came first, the music or the lyrics? But since this is an instrumental piece, I have to ask, so is this a written out piece or is this a improvised piece? Yeah, so this was completely improvised in the moment. So how I work with my group, the Briar Schlenker Trio, sometimes I will give a little bit of direction for a song or whatever. I'll say like, okay, Joy and I are going to start with a duet and I'm going to do electronics on it, but Joy is going to do piano and Jamie fit in whenever you feel like it and we'll just let it develop from there. Or I'll say something like, I want to end this piece on like a really like high climax point and cut off there. So look for an opportunity to do that. So I'll give that sort of direction, but generally just leave it up to the music. I had a feeling that there was a certain improvisational quality. However, there's this very, should I say, responsatory quality Mm -hmm. to things. So I, I actually was kind of fascinated because knowing that you were the performer on the cello, I focused my attention often on how the cello would float in between certain phrases and and come back in. And I kind of hopped on to this idea that there was a motive that you kept repeating Mm -hmm. rhythmically or that did it, 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 you know, and I, and I totally boffed that, but it, that, that was the, it's basically it, (laughs) you know, but, but that you would use that. And it was funny because it's only until, you know, a 10 minute mark that I was like, okay, here's the second motive where you go in between these. It's like it, you have these chords, I called them, but it's just the two notes that are mm-hmm. kind of interacting, going back and forth, sl- like kind of sliding into unison or having this kind of like almost unison and then yeah. kind of bouncing out. I thought that, oh, okay, that's the introduction of the second motive. But when I was listening, we just listened again. I was like, oh. There it is. You you have it at the end of one of the phrases. I hear that the the two notes kind of going in and out in there, and it, but it's very brief. Yeah. So I thought that was very very cool. How long have you been playing with the trio? Yeah. So our first concert was March of this year. We met one time before that concert for like a thirty minute just play together rehearsal that we also like took like publicity photos and stuff. I've known Joy and Jamie separately since I came to Urbana, basically. Joy and I were initially planning to collaborate on a contemporary classical work when I like just got to grad school and that was like a written piece of music and that didn't end up working out but we found out who each other was and that we sort of had this shared interest and kept sort of an engagement that way. I met Jamie my second year of masters through the group Improvisers Exchange which is a free improvisation group that Jason Finkelman runs. So by then I had played with both of them in different improvisational contexts and knew they were really awesome players and i had this idea for an album which is still in progress it's gonna hopefully release sometime at the end of the summer we'll see it's very heavy electroacoustic angle and focus the center piece of the album is a piece of contemporary classical music by the composer Kaya Sariaho. Real badass has been shaking up things for like 40 years and is like really super established composer. She has a piece called Set Papillon, Seven Butterflies, and her aesthetic is very influenced by a group of French computer musicians in like the 70s and 80s. They were called the Spectralists and they dealt a lot with the sound spectrum frequencies and like upper harmonic partials. She developed her sound through working with them and then took all that sort of electronic aesthetic and figured out how to do it on an acoustic cello. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous piece. Really cool to listen to and it's just obscenely, obscenely hard. So that's the centerpiece piece of the album and i wanted that to sort of be the acoustic electric piece of it to bookend the two this is why i started the band i knew i wanted to have a collaboration 
of some sort on the album that was an electroacoustic thing. And I knew that Joy, who is an excellent, excellent pianist, is also a really amazing theremin player. So I asked her, and she was super into the idea, and my buddy Jamie, the drummer, he has a solo act called 4Beat. His solo act, 4Beat, is drum kit with just like a whole slew of electronics and a zither that hasn't been tuned in like 14 years or something and it's in like a really yeah. weird scale and like running that through effects processing and stuff i asked both of them to do it and it was like let's go right yeah. right from the get-go so i divided this up into like minutes like this happens at this minute and because mm-hmm. i couldn't be like oh well you know the chorus you know five minutes in i was like theremin question mark because i kind of heard that but I, I now i'm also thinking isn't the like at the very beginning you know, around minute one, there's like that that hum that mm, yeah, you know, is that's that, the theremin. Going. That is the theremin. Okay. Oh, and then actually, um, the sort of like glitchy thing is me playing an instrument called a Moog subharmonicon. It's an analog synthesizer, poly generator. It's basically a drum machine that's really, really expressive. But you're also with your cello, you're running it through effects pedals as well. Not on that track, but when I perform other things, yes. And we recorded a few other tracks in the same day, and those do use the electric cello, but we ended up on this one because it was like, yes. Okay, so that's (laughs) funny because, you know, honestly, you know, whenever you deal with something that is an acoustic instrument or is an analog instrument or, I don't know, something that needs miking of some kind and... and I, I, I'm always fascinated with, if you don't, be, the, the pre-effects of being able to make an instrument sound like something else, which I think is such a, like, anti-meta thing. <laughs> like, it's, it's like, how does an instrument exist to create a sound of another instrument? Why don't you just play the instrument of the thing that, you know, it, it's like, it's this weird... To me, that's where you get into more of like the philosophical side of like mm-hmm. music and like what is sound. Uh, the reason I originally asked about how long have you been playing together is because there seems to be an acknowledgement between all of all three players, like when it's time to move on to mm-hmm. a next part, and then I and I feel like it's one of those communication things that. I, I don't know many non musicians can understand. Like, how does that, how does that, it's almost like this, uh, almost like a psychic connection of interaction yeah. um, that, that is really based on, you know, physical cues and et cetera and musical cues. And I, I'm just, curious like how did that gel if that turns into a question if that makes sense no i i I get what you're asking this is one of the things i love most about playing in this group is it's just like driving a ferrari like everyone listens Mm. so well and is so responsive and is willing to go with the flow and be flexible a lot of it is just like we're actively listening to each other and trying to make decisions that aren't necessarily, I want to sound like my colleague, but I want to do something to lift them up or maybe even to go against them. Having that sort of very conscious, active intentionality among the three people going all the time is how it gels, basically. Hmm. And having that group focus, it is a sort of communication. It's the kind of communication where it's like, we all have to make our decisions independently, you know, because like I can't can't say like go here, do the do this in the middle of the track. It just happens, and with that, like sometimes when we perform, it doesn't work. <laughs> sometimes we mm-hmm. drift apart a little bit, but not usually. Usually, we're able to keep the space. What we hear in this recording is this the first time you've played it, or had you rehearsed? this before this piece was created in the moment and we're never going to play it again (laughs) since it was so free it just happens and that's sort of like one of the things i really like about this kind of music is every single piece or song or whatever is special and is unique and is never going to happen again 
Okay. I, it's just funny to me because I, I always think of even a good improvisation requires some level of rehearsal, but the jumping without a net may be the part that makes it so exciting and fresh even for the players themselves. Yeah. And therefore you can get a very honest take of everything. Absolutely. So for the end of my grad work, I had been doing some research into improvisation in the classical tradition. Improvisation is not practiced among classical musicians, like hardly at all. It's just not a skill that's taught. It's sort of like considered to be intimidating and the territory of jazz musicians. But like, if you look historically at like treatises and like all these players like Leopold Mozart, who is Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's dad, was like a really well-known improviser. It feels honest and I'm playing exactly what I do want to be playing when I make music like this. It's interesting in that way, and that gives you like a different level of engagement than if I'm playing like a piece by Brahms or whatever, mm. or something that I've played a bunch of times before and have practiced a lot, and like my fingers can do it without me really thinking about it. That's a pitfall for written music is like there's the potential that you could tune out a little bit, huh. um, but not with this kind of music. It'll it'll just not work. <laughs> you have to be exactly in the moment or it just will pass you by and then you're not you're not interacting anymore. yeah you you're could just... miss an opportunity in the beginning that the electronic beat that's you generating that using the the moog or yeah so actually that's that's the one thing i will say like was not necessarily completely improvised in the moment because the way the machine is laid out it is it's a, just a bunch of dials and switches and plugs um there's no keys to it or anything it's just a box of circuits when i'm going to perform and i like start out playing on the moog i always figure out a patch i like beforehand and something that i like know is going to be solid to start off of mm. but then i'll like improvise with the patching from there i have a good starting point and then every decision i make on the electronics from there is going to be organic because i have to do one step at a time with what i'm changing basically mm -hmm. whether i plug this into that or like turn this rhythm on or switch like the octave or whatever but it's always gonna be like branching off each time this, this may be sounding like i'm asking the same question um from previous but so that motive did that just happen and then you just picked up on it because it seems like it repeats all the way through because it it's so interesting because <laughs> i hear the parts you know the piano imitates it and then i hear james you know playing something on the snare that's doing the digga 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 it's, it's this strange passing of the motive around mm -hmm. was that something that you had kind of in your mind or is like as you're going in and jumping into the recording i have an answer to that knowledge that has been passed to me through learning to compose and learning to make music is sort of this idea of an economy of ideas so like you don't want to overload the listener with oh i play this thing and then i play this thing and it's super different and then i play this other thing and it's super different and i it, keep changing it all the time because then you're sort of like in this like wash of i don't know what's happening and there are a lot of things being thrown at me and i don't really know how they gel together but if you've got something that's like kind of a hook you can keep changing it and changing it and changing it while keeping it like recognizably like the same yeah. construct or whatever. It's a way that I like to develop a musical idea, have my idea and then see how many like different like permutations there are yeah. for it. How do you vary a theme? Like mm. what are some examples? Like I don't mean for this to be like a, a training session, but, but in your mind, how do you vary a theme? Like, mm. what are some examples, like, things that I'm thinking of are, like, y you diminish the theme, like, in terms of the rhythm, or you augment the theme, uh, mm. you change the way that it's played, you know, you know, it's marcato versus licato, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, that's what, that's kind of what I was thinking, but if, if you have better words than I do, that would be amazing. I think I feel it much more viscerally than that. Mm. I used to think 
very conceptually and intellectually when I play like, oh, I want this phrase to be like this much more and I want this thing to peak here. And thinking of all of this information and step-by-step stuff is a way that I used to play. And honestly, I find it just so gets in my way. When I'm playing, I want to let my body execute what my ears are wanting to hear, basically. So getting into the how do you vary a theme thing, I don't know. That's that's an interesting question. I kind of just feel like it's something I do. I sing constantly at home to my cat, mostly songs about him. If you're like constantly making music, I think you figure out how to weave around and do cool stuff. I don't know. It's funny the way that my brain was processing it rather than sounds like the way that your brain processes it is I think about it as like, okay, I've got this theme as if you, you're, you've got this thing that you hold in your hand and then you just reach into your bag of tricks and just toss things at it, which mm. I don't think that's, and, and that's how I processed it rather than I feel like you take that theme in your hand and you interact with it. You, you feel what it's trying to tell you and then you tell it something and and it's this back and forth i don't know yeah you you raise up the little theme <laughs> <laughs> from from a young and when this was recorded did you do it as like these are all separate tracks or did you just do the stereo mic in the room or did you how how let, let's talk about how these like how these it was things. engineered yeah. yeah so our engineer for this was sam hopped drummer from media light array and mango pods sam engineered for us and it was i think six microphones on the drums two mics on the piano I have a small diaphragm condenser mic of my own for the acoustic cello. It's a good one for string instruments. The rest of it was DI, so like nine microphones. We improvised this conversation because <laughs> I, I had this whole, like, I was going to lay it out and I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, this that's, section. that's but, actually a really good way to think about improvising, actually, is that it is a conversation, hmm. you know, and that it is language. I mean, like, when I tell someone, like, hey, tell me a story at the end i'm not gonna say to them oh great story but you said like that word was wrong or you got those two ideas mixed up like that's that's just not how it works you right. know it gets to be this personal exuding of ideas i want to say my favorite part in this piece actually there's a few parts uh it's like around minute nine the previous part before was kind of this high I call it the high detached uh, motive of of the cello. Then it things kind of come together, and you you do you're doing some. There's this rhythmic syncopated, and you do a little bit of like slaps on the. I was going to say fretboard, but that's not the right. What what is the term? Um. um so what you were probably hearing is what's um called a Bartok pizzicato, and basically you. it's. You're plucking the string, but you're holding it with your fingers, and you pull it straight up, and you release it so it slaps into the string. Got it. Instead Got it. of pulling to the side so it rings, um, is is the other way to do that technique. Gotcha. And I was thinking of it as like if if you were playing like a bass, like actually slap, mm -hmm. which I think generates the same kind of tone because it's it, it's hitting it's the, the same thing with a different mechanism yeah totally was it then that was developed by or for to play you know bella bartok right is that is that where that came from the, um snap pits i think has been around since before bartok but he used it a lot and i th think maybe even developed the notation uh -huh. for it he might have invented the symbol i forget but that's where it's known. I, I'm going to have to throw in another one that I really <laughs> like, too, is that I, another minute and a half later, there's I, I call the motive two, which is the one where it's the two notes and they kind of intertwine. The pain chords. <laughs> pain, oh, that's funny. I, I think, what did I... Uh, well, oh, I, I, I said like lament and uh, yeah. descent without resolve is what... <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, that's pretty painful, but generates this sense of like almost but not quite and then it's like back away from it once again like almost made it 
didn't make it. Because even, even in the middle, between the, the rhythmic syncopated part, which I mentioned, and then the the pain chords, there's even a part where Jamie does... I, I almost want to say like it's it's this jazz feel where mm-hmm. like the the drums kind of kick in and the one thing about improvisation and drums is about the time that your brain wants to wrap around a rhythm to follow it and be like okay and something you can nod your head to by about the time that your brain recognizes that and is ready to like cinch down to it it's already moved on to another one but that's that's kind of my favorite part in in this piece do you what's your favorite part like once i start playing on the acoustic cello i like that whole like sort of jazzy or section hmm. it was a lot of fun and that's pretty early on it's in like the... in it starts maybe like minute two two and a half or something yeah yeah so I'm I'm just curious. My final question is: So, why did you pick this piece as the piece that you wanted to talk about today? Because we just released it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's usually that's I, I, there's usually a lot of that because you know it's it's the most recent, yeah, and fresh and and like representative so, yeah. of what I'm doing, or at least of the stuff that's completed that I'm doing. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even in the midst of the current coronavirus pandemic, the Jubilee Cafe is continuing to serve packaged, home-cooked meals free to all every Monday evening, 5 to 6.30 p.m. Meals are available for pickup outside the 6th Street door to the Community United Church of Christ in Champaign, Illinois, 805 South 6th Street. Jubilee Cafe's mission remains the same. Feed hungry people by cooking healthy and delicious meals. We are open to anyone who cares to receive a meal. For information on the meal or how to volunteer, go to the Jubilee Cafe CUCC Facebook page or email us at jubilee.cafe at community-ucc.org. Welcome back. So, Briar, do you have a favorite Champagne Urbana venue? Mm, the Rose Bowl, for sure. I've performed there literally more than anywhere else in town, even as a university student. I love it there. It's really welcoming home for experimental music and everything. They actually just asked me to put together a concert for July 3rd, which the Briar Schlenker Trio will be playing on, and then... I'll also be doing some solo electroacoustic electronics with cello stuff as well. Just like having a place like that in town that's actively trying to make this music happen is just like such a blessing for Champagne Urbana, honestly. You know, we talked a little bit about this in the pre interview a little bit, but like, how did you get around to, you know, experimental music being a originally a classically trained musician how was that how did that come about that's a good question i think probably my first real exposure to experimental cello stuff would have been zoe keating and that would have been when i was a lot younger but definitely left an impression but more like directly what got me into experimental music was discovering musicians like john zorn has been a huge huge influence he's sort of the big granddaddy experimental jazz saxophone player in the new york downtown scene and is a really prolific both jazzer improviser composer of both like new jazz music and classical music has a million projects gets into like heavy metal noise stuff seeing someone who has that varied and intense and compelling of a career and makes such amazing music was my first oh my god what if i did that through my own explorations met people like jeff ziegler is a cellist also based in new york city he's the former cellist of the chrono string quartet which is a very long-standing new music quartet they might have just passed like their 35th season or something mm. they've been around a long time 
I knew that I wanted to have a career that I wouldn't get bored in. When I was in undergrad, I was already getting bored of orchestra music, and it's just like that classical career path does not gel super well with me. I don't respond well to authority. Orchestra environments, just like I figured out, weren't for me, and since that's the stock, sustainable classical music career path, I knew that I had to figure something else out, and I had to forge a career doing something that I would find interesting. I was lucky at U of I to get really solid music business and entrepreneurship classes that gave me the groundwork for how to even do a career like this and like getting bookings as a soloist or as a band person, creating a personal aesthetic or brand, both like as a marketing thing, but also as like the music itself the act of creating something like that could potentially happen. I was lucky to have some of that knowledge passed down. I've I've been asking this question. It seems like since, since 2020, you know, (laughs) we, we had a shelter in place and, and most venues were shut down and it became very apparent that being able to interact in a musical way. And even, even if, as we're talking about, how improvisation is a conversation is like interaction. It's become very, very apparent how much a community of people, music is that community. And it's so very important to us, our existence. I'm curious, what do you think makes a good music community or even broader, a good community? Mm. I think what it boils down to is interaction and collaboration and really like having people who are interested and invested in the music of the people who they're interacting and making music with. And there is that sort of mutual support among the artists. Again, with Rose Bowl being a great venue in town, like I'm there at shows all the time. We have great local artists and and I know all of them basically. Right. I'm going to hear some great music. I'm also going to support my friends and vice versa is true for when I'm performing. Mm-hmm. There's that connection and interest with each other. What would you like to see more of in Champaign Urbana? I would like to see more like heavy music shows basically so i'm a metalhead i like hardcore music i make noise and there are some really really interesting artists doing that kind of music here i know vorpalatus um is a noise act here zoe thought crime media light array who we mentioned really awesome performers and i think that kind of music just i mean it is edgy it isn't always hard to get people to come to those concerts but it would be cool if champagne urbana came to them right and and if there were just like more shows for that that's honestly like one of the things i personally miss here is that i do like making this kind of really raw aesthetic in some of my own music and i i don't really have a space to perform that right all the time i find it fascinating how you know a lot of the experimental and noise people all know each other yeah and and it's funny because it's like well what venue could they have seen each other at right like there's it's a i mean it, rose bowl does an awesome job of making that available so so does the imc Mm -hmm. but you know actually um c4a has a noise ensemble now um that's the one i mentioned before that i was in it is still operating i'm just not in it there is some stuff going on but it's like once or twice a year that's sort of where it's at there's a lot of recorded work that's out there the recorded work is important as kind of a mark as something as a record but honestly noise shows in the moment at the location being able to see because sometimes half half of what a good noise show is is how the performer is emoting the things that you can't hear yeah you know what i mean like there's 
there's something uh, about seeing that live that you can't quantify in a recording. Totally. So it, it, it is very important that that exists. All kinds of music, I think, are better live most of the time, <laughs> unless it's like computer generated algorithm music or whatever. Then it's just like the same wherever. But also, like with a noise show, completely different experience if I'm listening through my headphones loud versus having loud speakers like making my heart stop in front of oh. me. Like that's such a big part of the experience for me, is it's just like. For, for the listeners, I just like shook my fists really hard. <laughs> Yeah, to be able to physically feel the music. What do you think Champaign-Urbana can do better? I think the listeners of Champaign-Urbana as a whole mm -hmm. could take more risks with the music that they're listening to and come to more shows that they're like, I have no idea what I'm in for, but I saw a cool poster and I'm going to this show, you know? <laughs> yeah. What do you think Champaign-Urbana does well? they are doing well i would say is that that there is like a community for experimental and improvised music and some listeners might know the name jason finkelman who does all of the jazz avant-garde and global music programming for Cranert center but he's made it his personal work in town to create a community of improvisers which was not there when he got here from what i gather at least not nearly to the extent that it is now. Jason's been getting this kind of stuff programmed for all that time and like literally created the conditions that would allow the Briar Schlenker trio to form, both in that having that improvisation like groundwork like that's a way you can make music in champagne urbana but also that like he introduced Jamie and I. The scene is great here for improvised music. Hmm. Just like Always strive, always keep growing, keep an open mind. Champagne is also a band podcast is proud to support Exile on Main Street. Exile on Main Street, located in the old train station building at 100 North Chestnut Street in downtown Champaign, has been helping to build record collections since 2004. Carrying a wide array of new and used LPs, CDs, and video games. Exile on Main Street has something for just about any music enthusiast and old school gaming devotee. Exile also hosts regular free live music shows on its stage, so be sure to check out their Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages for the up-to-date details on the next upcoming event. Open seven days a week. They can be reached by phone at 217-398-MAIN. That's 217-398-6246. Welcome back. So, Briar, what is your favorite non-musical thing or things? Definitely cooking and good food is probably my biggest passion outside of music. I've been cooking since I was young. My dad did most of the cooking in my house, so I learned from him. When I got to undergrad, I needed a job, so I worked in a campus diner for a while and sort of like got my skills there and did that for a little bit. Then quit that job a little while after, and this past summer, I just finished my first year of grad school and I needed a job. COVID labor shortage was very much in my favor at that point. So I walked into Hamilton Walkers. They didn't hire me on the spot, but they were like, come back the next day and like, you'll cook a shift with us. And then they hired me on the spot. For people who don't know what Hamilton Walkers is, it's a very fancy steak and seafood restaurant. Really amazing food. They're great service too. I needed a job and I wanted training in, in cooking, which I... I love doing and I was very upfront with chef saying basically like yes this is a job for me but also I'd sort of like to think of it as an, sort of almost an apprenticeship position and they were like totally game for it so mm -hmm. I spent three months in the kitchen learning as much as I could and cooking a ton of amazing food every day and had a pretty great summer wow <laughs> yeah well so now do you follow recipes or do you improvise? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's when I 
No, I, I improvise. <laughs> you improvise. Oh, no, I, that's I, awesome. When I bake, I will usually consult a recipe to figure out what the ratios are, and then I'll sort of just, like, do the rest, or if it's, like, I brought in some peach cobblers for his fun today. So for, like, that, all of the base of the batter, what makes it cobbler, I followed a recipe for, but for, like, the flavoring and stuff and past peaches, like... The brandy, the vanilla, the what have you, nutmeg, cinnamon, whatever. That's all like to my own taste and you, this is what I feel like right now. When I cook like on a stove top, I usually just do it. Do you have a favorite thing that you like to cook? I was a really big bread baker for a while and my KitchenAid actually <laughs> just like blew a fuse or something so i haven't gotten it service yet and so i'm not making any bread right now because i'm not gonna need my own bread <laughs> right um, oh is that you're talking about like the, the, the stand mixer yes. yeah those things are amazing mixers. it's I, so great I, you don't understand why why you would spend that much on a mixer but oh my gosh it's so like, great yeah they're like tanks my mixer is, has a unique problem is the minimum amount of bread dough I can make at a time is four loaves worth. Oh. Yeah. That's, uh... It's a big one. <laughs> um, uh, well, you know, you, you can't... I've been, I've been getting into some, like, fermenting stuff recently. I just made a batch of kimchi. That's like, oh, oh my God. Awesome. Yeah. And, like, and, and is there... I mean... I, I think in, to a certain extent you have to you have to ferment to a certain like ratio like baking but did you improv a little bit on the on some of the spices or I researched a couple recipes to just sort of like figure out what the principles of making kimchi is but hmm. it's just lacto fermentation which basically means food in liquid and the microbes that were on the food ferment it for you you don't yeah. you just like set it you leave it briar thank you for being on the show and telling me about your song electrophorus electrophorus yeah electrophorus i knew i was gonna <laughs> say it I, and then telling me about improvising and becoming a part of the champagne urbana music scene and uh and your favorite non-musical thing so thank you so much thanks so much for having me Thank you for listening to Champagne is Also a Band podcast. This is Briar Schlenker of the Briar Schlenker Trio. Reminding you, great music is out there. Go find it where you live. Champagne is also a band. You almost have an NPR voice. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> Studio. South Beaker. On the inside.